it is now the opportunity for me to be able to give to you my annual address, something that actually I really look forward to each year, sharing with you not only a report of what's been going on in the life of this diocese over the past year, but also a sense of where are we headed, and something of my heart as I think and pray for the Diocese of Central Florida. Two quotes have informed something of my thinking. The first is, you see right up there, Sam Alberry, the person most utterly different to you is no less loved by God than you, no further from his grace than you, no less worthy of the death of Christ than you. It takes a stupendous miracle to save any of us. Sam Alberry is heading up an organization in the UK called Living Out. Um, Sam is a evangelical gay Christian committed to a life of personal celibacy and has been a real voice in the midst of the conversations that have been happening in the Church of England. I would definitely commend his website. Second is from um, a great book on how to think. You got it up there, yeah, Alan Jacob's book. A part of what we wrestle with right now as a culture is that we are ill-equipped on how to think carefully and thoughtfully. Uh, it's all about how I feel in a way that actually negates our capacity to reason. And so I offer this quote, thinking does not have a destination, a stopping point, a, well, we're finally here. To, see, to cease thinking, as Thomas Aquinas explained, is an act either of despair, meaning I can't go further, or presumption, I need not go any further. What is needed for the life of thinking is hope, hope of knowing more, understanding more, being more than we currently are. If you're not checking your presuppositions and doing that kind of interior work, you will always have the sense of feeling stuck, and as a result, incapable of addressing the complexity of the issues that are before us, not only as a society, but also as a church. A part of what it means to love God with all your mind, as well as your heart and your soul, is that you bring the very best of what God has given you to engage in this process of discernment and care for one another. Now, with that in mind, if we could please show the video clip. Volunteers lined up this afternoon, ready to lend helping hands unloading a massive amount of donated food. 50,000 pounds of food represents about one year's worth of giving for a large food pantry. Um, this will be shared among five to ten food pantries, so this will, this will probably be gone in two to three months. Someone told Reverend John Clark about the untapped food in Jacksonville last week, and as director of No One Hungry, he figured it was worth a call to see if that food could be distributed here. Immediately, we started working on how could we get semi-tractor loads full of it, and what could we do with, from there. Today, they filled two tractor trailers with 52 pallets of food in Jacksonville and brought it here, where the volunteers lined up to help unload it. It's the largest donation no one hungry has ever seen. Each box can feed a person for a day, but it will likely be broken down and handed out by individual families' needs. There's cereal and milk in these packages, which will be very, very helpful, especially the milk. We rarely get shelf-stable milk into our food pantry. Pantries across Central Florida started picking up donations today, and now this food meant for those left behind in Puerto Rico will feed anyone in need here in Central Florida. We have a lot of need with all the Puerto Rican families that have arrived, and all our food stocks have been dwindled down to their lowest we've seen. It was like we got a Christmas present from God. Describing this as a Christmas present is what I told a reporter who had come to St. John's Kissimmee to see the 250,000 pounds of non-perishable food that was being delivered. Thanks to Deacon John Clark, who had the contact with FEMA, the support of Deacon John Modus, who arranged for the two 18-wheelers and drivers to bring the food from Jacksonville down to Kissimmee, this, as well as the excellent, excellent publicity work of Deacon Becky Chapman and the fine leadership of Archdeacon Christy Alday. In less than one week from the initial phone call, we were delivering emergency food relief to people in need here in Central Florida. 
As you heard Jose say in the video, the vast majority of the food is going to recently arrived U.S. citizens from Puerto Rico, devastated by Hurricane Maria. But anyone who needs it can get it. As Deacon Clark's organization title says, no one hungry. Since then, to our shock and gratitude to God, over $250,000 in emergency aid has arrived for this very enterprise, mostly from Trinity Church Wall Street and the Episcopal Relief and Development Organization. These generous grants have created the possibility of a center on the campus of St. John's Kissimmee in Osceola County, because Osceola it really is the epicenter for where many of the Puerto Ricans are going, as again, over 250,000. I really see God's hand in this. If there was ever an opportunity to fulfill Jesus' commandment, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was naked and you clothed me. This is it. If you are interested in more information as to how your church can be involved, I would urge you to contact Father Jose Rodriguez, who, besides working a full-time secular job serving as priest at Jesus de Nazareth, also father and husband, is organizing these Herculean efforts. Serving with him is also the Reverend Gladys Rodriguez, whom I ordained in 2016 as a priest here in the Episcopal Church and a layman by the name of Manny Ayala. Besides the devastation of Puerto Rico, other islands were similarly devastated, including the Virgin Islands. And Father Christopher Brathwaite has overseen Caribbean relief efforts from our diocese. In October, eight barrels of baby products like diapers, wet wipes, lotions, and paper towels went to the U.S. Virgin Islands. A second shipment of goods went again to the Virgin Islands in November. In a thank you letter to the Diocese of Central Florida, the Bishop of the Virgin Islands, the Right Reverend Ambrose Gums, shared this prayer with me. Quote, God, let our prayers be full of thanks for all you have done for us. Let our words be of appreciation to others for how they have helped us or have allowed us to help ourselves. Let our lives be reflections of gratitude by which we attract blessings and good things in Jesus' name, amen. Texas and parts of Louisiana were drastically impacted by Hurricane Harvey. And financial donations from our diocese and from people around the country who sent money to us totaled over $6,000 and were sent to the rector of St. John the Divine Houston, someone I know personally, the Reverend Clay Leon. St. John the Divine is a large church and turned its gymnasium into a relief center under the direction of their new assistant, we all know, the Reverend Charlie Holt, formerly of St. Peter's Lake Mary. Also, the Reverend Louis Samuelson, a seminarian from St. Matthew's Orlando, now also serves in that vibrant congregation, and they are doing outstanding work in the city of Houston. Central Florida was hit by Hurricane Irma, and Episcopal Relief and Development served as an invaluable partner. ERD led webinars, for clergy regarding emergency assistance, organized daily calls with representatives from the five dioceses in Florida were always in touch and ready to help. Uh, Holy Trinity Melbourne and St. Matthew's Orlando were two parishes to whom ERD provided emergency assisting funds for ministry affected by the storm. And we continue to work with St. Agnes in Sebring and Camp Wingman in their ongoing recovery as well. Deacon John Modis, our diocese and ERD relief coordinator, stepped in to organize and provide aid wherever possible, and I want to offer my personal thanks, and I ask that you would join me in thanking him and actually all who have done their time and effort in donating to the relief here in Central Florida and beyond. Each of these acts of service act out the theme of this convention, which is embracing our neighborhood. I applaud these heroic efforts, both small and great, that model such acts of compassion and service. Throughout, throughout 2017, I remained active serving our local congregations, which, of course, is my prime responsibility. During this past year, I participated in eight celebrations of new ministry, 50 parish visitations, <laughs> Oh, yeah. You, you can't believe what you get asked to do at some of these things. Wearing a miter feels odd enough. <laughs> um, 
There were 219 confirmations, 70 receptions, and 12 baptisms. Each of these visits are intentionally and primarily pastoral in nature, reaching out to clergy and lay people alike. They are my effort to help fulfill one point of our diocesan strategic plan. We are strengthening our relationships with one another and becoming even more deeply a diocesan family. One PS. When we were at St. John's Kissimmee and all of the um, people showed up from the various television stations, and at one point there were four different stations represented, uh, they were astonished at the fact that while we were doing really hard work unloading all of these boxes, we were having a blast, laughing and talking to each other, conversations in English and in Spanish, and they were like, you all really like each other. <laughs> and, and I said, well, yeah, of course we do. And, and they said, oh, no, you don't understand. Most of the places we get called, people are yelling at each other. It is a relief, and they hung out. Uh, even one of the people who volunteered had a pet pig, and the pet pig got passed around. It really became a kind of wonderful and actually profoundly Christian witness to the reporters who showed up from the television stations and from the Orlando paper. Um, such deep and effective service could not come about without the fine teamwork of our diocesan staff. I continue to be grateful for each one of them. And I also want to say about them is, is that a part of what we do, and though it's unintentional, it's what happens, and I hope this is your experience when we come, is that we are a Christian community as a staff that care about and pray for each other, as well as for you, especially at the Thursday Eucharist. And that so when somebody comes in, they're welcomed into that ongoing life that we share with one another. That's my model of how an office staff at a local congregation ought to work. In essence, a microcosm of Christian community into which anyone gets invited if they walk across the threshold. So I cannot tell you how grateful I could go on and on and on about each one, but otherwise then I can't report on other things. But they all do above and beyond. They're, there isn't a slacker in the bunch, and I'm very, very grateful to all of them. But most of all, I want to express in public my love and appreciation for my wife, Laura Lee. She is my driver, my counselor, my don't forget to do this reminder. She is a fashion trendsetter in her array of hats. She is generously hospitable, making our home a haven of hospitality and care. She is also a woman of deep prayer who keeps her prayer list on the mirror, actually, in the bathroom that she uses. And as I have told her numerous times, Laura Lee, I could not do this job without you. Thank you. Strategic point two, we are raising up new leaders and are committed to doing so both with time as well as finances for both clergy and laity. During 2017, 31 people were ordained, 11 to the priesthood, 14 to the transitional diaconate, 6 to the vocational diaconate. Monday evening, this coming Monday at the cathedral, I will ordain four more transitional deacons, Katie Gillette, Kevin Bartle, Kathy Hewlin, and Jim Laudit. Presently, the total number of people in our discernment process right now is 52. 16 seeking, seeking ordination to the vocational diaconate, 36 seeking ordination to the priesthood. If you are presently in our ordination process, or if you were ordained in 2016, would you please stand? can't tell you how proud I am of them. These new ordinance include, include a higher number of younger adults, a higher percentage are women, and this group is more racially diverse. Why? Because if you are doing what you can to embrace your neighborhood, people who are representative of those who are, you are trying to reach must be included in your leadership, especially in public. If visitors come and do not look up at those who are robed, both lay and ordained, and if they don't see people like themselves, 
they will be far less likely to return, not re to return, and are more inclined to believe that people like them, quote unquote, are not welcome. It is critically important that you aggressively recruit people who look like the people whom you are trying to reach in your neighborhood. Presently, we have students at Asbury in Oviedo, Gordon Conwell's Anglican Studies Program, Duke Anglican Episcopal House of Studies, Neshota House, Seminary of the Southwest, Swanee, and Trinity School for Ministry, many of whom, by the way, have booths in the display area. Also, our canon for vocation, the Reverend Dr. Justin Holcomb, works directly with all in our priest track to make sure that he or she gets the right classes to adequately prepare them, both for the general ordination exams and, more importantly, for good service in the parish. Archdeacon Christy Alday, whom I think you know cannot be here due to illness, continues to raise the quality and make more accessible our vocational training through the Institute for Christian Studies. More classes can be taken online, and a wider variety of teachers and subjects are available both for those who want to strengthen their vocation to lay service, as well as preparation for the vocational diaconate. Check the diocesan website for information. Also, I am pleased to announce, announce that the Reverend Christopher Brathwaite is assisting me in the pastoral care of clergy. Father Brathwaite recently retired from parish ministry, having last served at St. Mark's Haines City. Besides offering pastoral care to clergy, he is also presently the interim of St. Peter's Lake Mary, and I understand they're having a wonderful time together. God continues to bless those preparing for ordination through the Timothy Fund, a fund that we started here in the diocese in 2014. The fund is a need-based scholarship that targets those who are preparing for ordination to the priesthood, primarily in residential programs because they're so expensive. I also want to express my appreciation for all who serve on the Commission on Ministry, especially its care, Mr. Orman Kimbrough. Orman's southern charm, combined with his thoughtful leadership and the occasional joke, have made him an exceptional chair. Also, I'm very grateful to the Reverend Dr. Wally Reynolds and Dr. John Robertson, who continue to provide insightful evaluations and psychological testing as required for all who seek ordination. Strategic point three, we are looking at our neighbors and facing the missionary challenge that is before us. Besides the large donation of food distributed at St. John's Kissimmee and to other food closets around the diocese, Wonderful work is being done all over the diocese to reach out to our neighbors through food pantries, parochial schools, after-school programs, the Open Table Project for resettling the homeless, job partnerships, a new children's service that's way out of the box and doing incredibly well at St. Michael's Orlando, and informal evening services in All Saints Winter Park at the Cathedral intentionally meant to reach out to people who may not like what we do on a Sunday morning. Also, Deacon Mary Delancey at Grace Church is working through the International Justice Mission in the area of human trafficking. Yes, it happens right here in Central Florida. And Gateway to Hope Feeding Program, where Father James Giles serves and is touching the homeless and the poor in the Old Cala area in the ways that are exemplary. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but a sample of the good work God is doing through our congregations in the diocese. People are catching the vision. In the aftermath of the Pulse shooting, we continued our ministry to the LGBTQ community through hosting a memorial service for the victims at the cathedral, as well as donating through money that we have received uh, over $11,000 to Projecto Somos Orlando, who have reached out to the Hispanic community in the aftermath of the Pulse shooting. Also, as a follow-up, Fathers Adam Young and David Bumstead and Deacon Nancy Oliver conducted a well-attended seminar at SOMOS headquarters entitled Faith in the LGBTQ Community. Our theme this year, Evangelism Embracing Our Neighborhood, invites us to ponder, and this is something worth considering, whether or not through these ministries other people are actually coming to newfound faith in Jesus Christ. The call of the Great Commission is to go and make disciples of all nations. And my hope is, is that God would guide us in how we might accomplish that commission using these acts of service to bring people to faith. It is in the light of this that new church plants are being started 
or in the planning stages for Lake Nona, Horizons West, which is between Winter Garden and Windermere, and the ever-expanding phenomena called the Villages that is projecting the construction of 30,000 new homes just in the next 12 to 16 months. We continue to be the beneficiary of significant population increases, with people coming in from all over the United States and beyond. God is blessing our efforts, and recently Bethesda Church received $100,000 in grant money. Not all of our communities are beneficiaries of these population increases. Some are decreasing and a part of what we're trying to think about in terms of stewarding our resources as the largest piece of our diocesan budget is going to aided congregations, where is the best place to use them? And as a result, for example, that has meant that some small congregations that have no prospects of growth and are really only handling maybe a family or two may close in the process. And recently, we closed St. Anne's Wachula. We realize that supporting dwindling numbers in some of our communities may not be the best use of our resources when other communities are expanding and some at an explosive rate but have no Episcopal Church presence. It is not an easy task, but stewarding our resources is incredibly important. We also have congregations experimenting with new forms of church. These are off-site meetings in homes, restaurants, coffee shops, community centers. These new forms of church fall under the heading of fresh expressions, about which you will hear more later today. Strategic point number four. We are re revitalizing children and youth ministry. For several years, the diocese has been in a strategic partnership with the Youth Ministry Institute under the director of Steve, directorship of Steve Schneeberger. Steve has ably served as a consultant working with both existing parish youth ministries as well as working with congregations who are interested in starting a youth ministry or revitalizing a declining one. One indicator of this fine work is that this time last year, we had 46 parishes with youth ministry. This year, I am happy to report that number has increased from 46 to 68. Steve has stepped down from that position as Youth Ministry Institute Director, but now Mrs. Kirsten, Kirsten Knox has taken his place. Kirsten, would you please stand, as well as any others who are involved in youth ministry here? Any a youth ministry worker in Kirsten, if you would please stand. Kathy, Steve, Kevin. And as you will see from those who stand, you don't necessarily have to be young to do youth ministry. <laughs> I participated in two youth events this past year, the Bishop's Youth Event at Camp Wingman, Seoul in the City, All Saints Lakeland. Both were a joy. And the youth event, the Bishop's Youth Event especially, was marked by raw honesty and genuine healing. It does bring you up short, but step in. When you walk into the chapel at Camp Wingman, and there are these two whiteboards up on the stage of where they need personal prayer, and they have things like, I cut myself. I'm addicted to pornography. Things like that. And I thought, well, if you're going to be that honest, let's go. And the Lord really did some incredibly remarkable work over the course of that weekend. You should also know that New Beginnings, thanks to the fine leadership of Phyllis Bartle continues and continues to thrive. The next one is coming up soon. Father Deke Miller has now left his position at Camp Wingman, having done a, a good job. He's now priest in charge of Holy Cross Winter Haven because we needed somebody there. And as a result, Father Bill Yates has now accepted the position of interim director, which remember he did that full time before. He's also recruited Joshua Joseph to oversee the summer camp ministry. JJ, as he is known, is an alumni of Camp Wingman and an extremely capable leader. JJ, are you here? He is going to be introduced later in the program. If you've been a, a counselor on Camp Wingman, you know the guy and you know how great he is. Uh, this summer will be a very exciting time at Camp Wingman. I continue to work to strengthen our relationships with our Episcopal schools. I've been especially involved with Holy Trinity Episcopal Academy in Melbourne, 
and the calling of their new president, Dr. Kathy Cobb, who I'm very happy is there, and a Trinity Prep Orlando initiative working with Byron Lawson, their president, in the area of leadership development and what impact that will have on the curriculum at Trinity Prep. Paul Garcia of St. Barnabas continues to ably lead the Central Florida Episcopal Schools Association. They, the meaning the association, have begun a school-to-school -school partnership between our parochial schools and the parochial schools of the Diocese of Honduras, knowing that particularly there, who's in those schools are the future leaders of that country. Strategic point five, we are in a time of discernment, praying and asking God for his leadership in his missionary strategy. This strategic point has been and continues to be, honestly, something of a prayer request. I need God's help to be able to lead and to lead well. I need God to show me his missionary strategy. There is no seminary class training event or even previous parish experience that adequately prepares one for this position. In fact, for any clergy person, if you think, I've got this because of your previous experience, you're in big trouble. <laughs> the fruit of many years of ordination is not, now I know what to do. But instead, it is, now I know who to ask for help. One learns through prayer, affliction, victory, to seek the counsel of others and, pr and the prayers of others so that one can say with the psalmist, Psalm 121, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. In 2017, the challenge of a growing population and shifting demographics have particularly caused me to pray and seek God for his leadership and guidance, especially one where to plant new churches as well as evaluating the viability of existing ones, to finding way to better serve the exploding Hispanic population that is here, not coming, here. Three, our ongoing challenge of both evangelizing and serving the expanding gay population that is here in Central Florida. It is the third area, evangelizing and serving the expanded gay population that has been particularly challenging because as a diocese, we are not of one mind about how best to do that. As a bishop, I have a grid for making decisions. This grid comes straight from the Book of Common Prayer, and it is contained in the charge made to me when I was ordained to the Episcopate. That charge states that I am to be, quote, one with the apostles in proclaiming Christ's resurrection and interpreting the gospel, and that I am called, quote, to guard the faith, unity, and discipline of the church, and finally, that I am to, quote, with my fellow bishops, to share in the leadership of the church throughout the world, not just Central Florida, not even the United States, but the world. That's the nature of Episcopal leadership. Therefore, any action I take must pass through that grid, meaning one, it must be coherent with the faith of the apostles. Two, it must take into consideration the, any, the impact of any action and what that will have on, quote, the faith, unity, and discipline of the church. Three, it must be coherent with my global responsibility as a leader who shares that leadership with other bishops throughout the world. In other words, I'm not just thinking about what kind of impact it's going to have on All Saints Lakeland, Trinity Vero, you name the congregation. I need to think about the impact it will have on persecuted Christians in Pakistan. And I use that not as a hypothetical example, but one that is personal and real. So that in the midst of some of the stuff that's been happening the last two weeks, I was getting WhatsApp, which is where you can text someone and it, there's no charge internationally, from Pakistani Christians I personally know asking me for their prayers as they are undergoing persecution. The connection was powerful. Prior to this conversation, a series of three resolutions presented to the diocese from a group entitled, quote, the Subcommittee of St. Richard's Vestry, calling for the elimination of the last paragraph of Diocesan Canon 26, Section 10, which limits the clergy to only officiating at, quote, those unions prescribed by Holy Scripture and forbids the clergy from allowing to take place or participate in, quote, any other unions as proscribed by Holy Scripture, unquote. There were two resolutions for, which called for us to be, quote, a church committed to ending institutional and other forms of discrimination 
for LGBTQ people, unquote, and called for the formation of a task force that would, quote, consult with LGBTQ people who are members of this diocese and those who might have left the diocese. Though these resolutions contained material worthy of consideration, they failed, in my opinion, to live up to the requirements inherent in that grid regarding the faith unity and discipline of the church. As required by the canons, I consulted both our committee on constitution and canons, which includes Bill Grimm and Chancellor Wooten to my left, and the Standing Committee of the Diocese. They unanimously concurred with my opinion and counseled me not to permit them to come before the floor of convention. But you are owed an explanation. Why did I come to this decision? First of all, number one, the wording of the resolutions themselves were freighted for confrontation. They were provocative, far more than they were conciliar. Secondly, no theological justification was offered as to why such resolutions were worthy of passage. No whereases that in this case I thought were more than important. Also, and critically important, behavior leading up to this convention, especially on the clergy listserv, convinced me that it would not be possible to debate these resolutions without inflicting serious harm on the unity of the diocese. One illustration. Recently, I sat with a clergy person who confided in me that he could no longer go on CF Cleric because he began to read the posts around these resolutions a knot, began to form in, his st form in his stomach, and for his soul's health, he decided he could not continue to stay on the list, sir. He was around in the days when these controversies loomed so large that the entire diocese was marked by rancor and division. It was almost as if this priest was describing memories that felt like PTSD. It should be noted that these remarks were coming from a priest who supports the church performing gay marriages. His reaction only confirmed in my mind the rightness of this decision not to bring them to the floor of convention. I want no part in taking the diocese back to that divisive and harmful time in our history. Over the past six years of my episcopate, we have come too far in uniting around mission to now undermine those strides that we have made together. But it is not as if these discussions and these resolutions are unimportant, quite the opposite. They are deeply important to us in our common life together, as well as the discipleship of each of our brothers and sisters in Christ, both in the pew and in the pulpit. Therefore, while deciding that these resolutions should not come before this convention, I do believe that the formation of a task force is actually a very good idea. Therefore, I have called for the formation, I am calling, as of this speech, for the formation of a task force to deal with the concerns as outlined. I've asked Canon Justin Holcomb to chair this task force. It will have as its members no more than 15 people, both lay and ordained, whom I will appoint who represent the, the broad theological diversity that presently exists within the Diocese of Central Florida around the question of the church blessing same-sex marriages. The task force will offer a reflection on the recent actions of General Convention in providing liturgies for same-sex marriage and consider the implications, both canonical and pastoral, for our congregations in Central Florida. The task force will take into consideration the biblical, theological, and pastoral implications of these actions, and this reflection will be offered in the form of a report to our next diocesan convention. Please know, I have no desire to sweep these issues under the rug, and any accusation to that is patently false. However, I want these issues to be dealt with in a way that is coherent with what we have already been given in the prayer book, meaning living together as a diocese in a way that genuinely reflects the faith of the apostles as well as the unity and discipline of the church. That is the context that we have been given. We can't just jettison that for the sake of doing this, you know, whatever that might be, quite honestly. And so that's my job, is to make sure those things are in place and set a context for what I think is an extraordinarily important conversation. So you will be hearing more from that, and if you're interested in being a part of that task force, I urge you to let either Ken and Holcomb or me know. Besides, it will take some real work, so be prepared. 
Strategic point six, we are taking our place within the councils of the Episcopal Church. I continue to deeply value my friendship with Bishop Lloyd Allen of Honduras. I am saddened that the political unrest in Honduras made it impossible for him to lead the country. There's a contested election, and what's happening is that most of the airports for local Hondurans, as well as even some of the highways, have been shut down. He cannot leave, and he needs to be there for the pastoral care for his people. Please remember him and our companion diocese in your prayers. This past year, I traveled with West Dubik, Honduras Commission Chair, to Honduras in May 2017 for the Diocese of Honduras' Diocesan Convention. It was a blast. Great worship, excellent news about how they continue to move forward toward financial self-sufficiency, raising up new leaders for church plants. It was very, very exciting. I begin this section talking about Honduras because Bishop and Alan, Alan and I work closely together as fellow communion partner bishops within the House of Bishops. The passage of same-sex marriage liturgies has been seen by almost all of the bishops in Province 9, which is Central and South America, as a very unwelcome development. Their passage has been met by ac accusations of theological colonialism and a disregard for Hispanic custom. This has been underscored by a long-standing criticism by them of the inadequacy of the Spanish language of our, our materials, including our prayer book. These actions almost led, this, for them it was like, that's the last straw, led to the possibility of the province pro, uh, petitioning the Archbishop of Canterbury to separate from the Episcopal Church entirely and become their own Anglican province. It was only the heroic leadership of Bishop Allen that kept that development from happening. We owe him a lot. You see, the Episcopal Church's commitment to general, and this is probably one of the most important things I want to say, the Episcopal Church's commitment to genuine inclusion of all of its members has been thwarted by our commitment to govern by resolution and majority rule. Instead of acknowledging the significant differences of theology, geography, and culture, and working toward a consensus that would reflect that diversity, which would really be genuine inclusion, our history indicates that we have taken the lower road of convention resolutions, working the political system, gathering votes which would allow the majority to win, but without the true win of consensus, only the win won by power, but displayed by those who ha know how to work the political process. This does not look like the Church of the New Testament to me, and it leaves me weeping. The New Testament Church could work together and come to the point of saying, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Can we not find a way to do the same? Both theological liberals and theological conservatives have played the game of politics, resolutions, and the result has been internal polarization and the dwindling size of our church. It is only now where we see that the Episcopal Church is only a shadow of its former self and the American Anglican alternatives are really no better, that we are coming to realize that the political process exercised at our general convention is no longer serving us well. Many in the Episcopal Church thought they could ride either the tide of political justice on the one hand or the mantra of biblical values on the other and do their best to mow down the opposition by votes and parliamentary procedure. Neither side looks like Jesus to me. Meanwhile, many in the global communion are aghast at the way we treat each other and the secular world only knows us by our political slogans or our sexual scandals. It was this very spirit that almost split the Diocese of Central Florida 10 years ago next month when the animosity was so high that several churches left the diocese altogether, including the majority of the membership of Trinity Church Vero. Can we in 2018 find a different way? I must confess to you that the challenges that are facing us, population explosion, the bubbling resentment over the growth of the Hispanic population here, financial greed, the spirit of our age in which we live where, quote, political might makes right, unquote, 
and the train wrecks of poor leadership and sexual misconduct seem insurmountable. In many ways, we are doing much better than we were 10 years ago. But if ever there was a time when we needed God to lead us into this future, it is now. So as I begin to bring this address to a close, I would like us to do something different before I finish. I would like the musicians to lead us in a song that is, in fact, a prayer. It's a prayer asking God to come and bring about that which only he can do. So prayerfully from the heart, musicians, lead us. You have taken the precious from the worthless and given us beauty for ashes, love for hate. You have chosen the weak things of the world, the shame that which is strong, and the foolish things to shame the wise. You are help to the helpless, strength to the stranger. break down our divisions, clarify our gospel, empower by your Holy Spirit the meager efforts that we make to honor you in such a way as apostolic unity emerges. People come to faith in Jesus, and our hearts are glad as the fruit and gifts of the Spirit flow in our midst to the glory of your Son. So, dear Lord, we do ask that you would come and do what we cannot do, but are so desperately you needed. Help us, Lord, to wash one another's feet, serve the world in your name, that many sons and daughters will be claimed and in, into the kingdom of God. Help us, O oh Lord, to not just look in the rearview mirror, but serve, and to serve well, 
to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Though I call us to prayer, I do so because I know that God is kind, gracious, and runs to the cry of those who call upon him. So I call us to pray, not because I'm discouraged, but actually because I have hope. I deeply believe that it is through the power of intercessory prayer, the grace of wise counsel, and a heart big enough to embrace all who are in this diocese that we actually can move forward and meet the challenges that are in front of us. In 2018, we are well on our way to new growth, deeper faith, and stronger service. God has given this diocese a great team of leaders, clergy and laity, most of whom are in this room this morning. And I have learned to say over 40 years of ministry, I'm happy to say that we are learning to say our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So prayerfully and with genuine gratitude, I want to thank you, clergy and laity, for the privilege of serving together this past year. And I also want to thank you, Diocese of Central Florida, for allowing me to be your bishop. We are here to serve together. Let's do it. Thank you. <laughs>